Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straitest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. Many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. When we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the prick. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from York Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth. Today we have gathered together two brothers in Christ, me and two other brothers in Christ, so three all together, to continue our study in the book of Acts. We have uh, come to chapter 20 and we still do this to get a better understanding of the book of Acts for Michael, but also for Brett and also for myself, because every time when you study the Bible, you will get a little better understanding than you had before. This is because the Holy Spirit does not reveal everything all at once. You couldn't even take all that information all at once. But little by little, here a little and there a little, that's how we have to study the Bible. So we are gathered here together via Skype. Brother Brett from Minnesota and the United States of America and Brother Michael from Germany to read the 20th chapter or at least start with the 20th chapter of the book of Acts to get a better understanding of what Acts was all about because initially we started this to determine when did the 70th week of Daniel really end. We found that out and now we are going to read the whole book to its end 
because we want to get a better understanding. So therefore, I welcome, first of all, Brother Michael, who is geographically a little bit closer to me, before we go over the whole big ocean and visit Brother Brett over there in the United States. Hello, Michael, and welcome to the broadcast today. How are you doing? Yes, hello. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you for being so nice to me in spite of my bad English. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's uh, what uh, sets me apart to you guys, because you are so used to um, use the English language, uh, which I'm not, so I'm a little bit uh, behind here. And uh, I'm looking forward to Chapter 20 now, because I think that... Uh, And to, to the end of the, the chapter, there will be also more things to reveal. And uh, having uh, be, um, and revealing is also be, uh, very important because uh, I just had to use the, the uh, X chapter of the Bible uh, in the last uh, 14 days for several occasions. So I'm very much looking forward because I'm so curious. And uh, on the, the other end of the line, I think it's Brother Brett who's just uh, been awakened, and uh, yeah, greetings to you, brother. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much, Michael and Yerk. So good to be with you all the way from here in this uh, little place I live, this little Chisago City, Minnesota, all the way uh, to Europe, which is an incredible place, and I haven't visited Europe since 30 years ago. But I'm so thankful that I was there once and I, I toured uh, for three weeks with my brother and we took the Eurail Pass all over the place in Europe. And we even went to Rome, of all things. And, and it was an incredible adventure. But, you know, with these things, uh, I paid my price, so to speak. But we're not going to get into that. But, um, yeah, I was just looking over this book of Acts and... Um, This is a really intense study because we're dealing with the Jews and they're getting the gospel and they're not accepting it, are they? No, and we have already passed that point about the Jews getting the gospel because mm -hmm. he said already twice that, lo, since you have rejected the Spirit of God, we turn to the Gentiles. And um, this is where we're going to continue today, reading of that part. Because he is going all through Asia, as we will learn in chapter 20. He's doing a journey. And I put a little picture here that you can see that journey, how it's developed. You have the first, second, third, and the fourth journey, the journey to Rome. And those are nice. all the trips that he did. And so you can see we are today dealing with the The, the place where he is from here, where he goes to Miletus in the direction of Ephesus. Uh, Greece is over here, where you have Corinth and Athens. Uh, here, um, above you have Macedonia and Tyatara, which of course today is all Greece. But it's just that you can imagine a little bit the journey Paul does set on here in the book of Acts in chapter 20. We are going to continue to read. Yeah, great find. Thanks. And by the way, Michael, don't care for that you speak, quote-unquote, a little bit less well English than I or Brett do. That is all a question of um, training. And the more you speak, the better you Ooh, will be speaking comment. In, the, in the future. So I don't care that you have a little mistakes here and there. Please, Brett. Oh, yes. That just reminded me, Jörg. And I wanted to back that up. That uh, Yeah, thank you, Michael, for trying your best with English and English. It's a, it's a really important language in the sense that uh, you can study better the English history because in English history, we learn of all of the reformers that tried their best to serve God by bringing the word of God to the people. And I've been watching these videos that I got about the Reformation And, uh, yeah, it's really, really interesting to watch these videos. I just wish that, uh, I don't know if they're available on the Internet or not, but I'm going to try and get the, the links and send them to you guys because, uh, yeah, I think English is uh, this incredible study of the Bible. Um, and the more you get familiar with speaking English and reading English and thinking in English, 
the more you're going to be able to see the entire story or part of at least part of the story of uh, this history. Yeah, and the more you speak it, the better you speak it. I mean, that's the experience yeah, that I have from right. myself. Mm -hmm. So, Right. Since well, just Michael like if I were to try and learn German, you know, <laughs> I'd have to live in Germany to do that. Probably. I don't think I could do it here so easily. No, I think so too. But that's, in that's, Europe, you have so much closer borders. I mean, it's like me going to Canada or something like that or going to uh, down to Colorado or something, you know. Or, you know, of course, England is uh, separated by the channel, so you would have to take a ferry over there or something. But or you can take a train nowadays, too. Oh, train. Okay. Yeah. They have the channel, know you know. They have, you have the, oh, that's they have the tunnel right. beneath the channel. They call Got it. The channel, you know. Wow. No, but the difference between America and Europe in that regard is uh, we may have almost as many states in the same surroundings. It means in, in the same geographical distance. But with us, whenever you leave one state and you come to another, you also have a change of language. And that's something that you don't have in the United States of America. You can travel from Minnesota to California, but you always speak the same language. That's right. When you do the same here and you travel from Germany via Poland to Russia or via um, Austria to Italy to uh, Bosnia and Croatia and all that stuff, and there's always a different language involved. That's the very big difference, of course. And especially in the country where I live, in Belgium, we have three official languages here, you know. And mm -hmm. the point is that the more you speak those languages, the more um, possibilities you are given to speak the language, the better you speak it. I have the same with French. I do not speak French very well, but put me two weeks in France to live and I have no trouble speaking French. But it's, it's, it's um, you know, when, when Michael only has these little studies that we have, it is understandable that his English is not as good as ours. So... I have no problem with that, even though sometimes it's funny for me to always hear him make the same mistakes, but I don't want to correct him because I was the same as he was so many years ago. Mm -hmm. So right. I, I love his effort, you know, at least Michael does the effort to try to speak English. And many English people cannot even say that of themselves, that they are doing the effort um, to try to speak another language, yeah? like the French speaking part over here in Belgium. They always speak mm -hmm. only French and expect everybody else to speak their French. They don't speak Flemish. They don't speak German. They don't f speak English. Yeah, They are so chauvinistic like the French. They say it's our language and for the rest nothing. Well, okay. But Michael at least um, does his best to uh, adopt to the English language. And I have heard man many, many people who speak much worse English than Michael. So... Now, we have enough honey smeared around our mouths now. Let's go to the study. <laughs> yeah? Let's go to the nitty-gritty of the uh, meeting that we are having here together. We want to do a Bible study in uh, the book of Acts, chapter 20. That's where we left off. But for con continuation's sake, of course, I told you already a few times, the Bible is put into 66 different books. The books are not put into different chapters and verses. That was man who did this to help study this Bible. This is not something bad man did, but actually it is a continuous scroll. So when we go back to chapter 19, we will understand why it starts here and after the uproar was ceased, because hey, well, what uproar, what's he talking about? Well, then we have to go back a chapter. So I just go back a few verses and let us repeat, and then we go into chapter 20 for full understanding. I marked chapter, uh, verse 35 in chapter 19, and there we're going to take it off. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye, men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet, and to do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them implead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. 
for we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. And after the uproar was ceased that you've just learned about, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia, which you see here on the map, Macedonia, that's above here where my hand is. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece, means he traveled down this road, down Thessalonica, Berean, when he goes into Greece, which is Athens and Corinth. Okay? So, but now I'm going to leave this map alone, otherwise you get distracted from the reading. <laughs> and there about three months, and when the Jews laid wait for him, he was about to sail into Syria. He purposed to return through Macedonia. When the Jews laid wait for him, yeah, this is once mentioned here, and this is a little bit later mentioned in the same chapter here, when Paul speaks about it. And lying in wait means to ambush him, to do treachery against him, or to plot against Paul. This is what this is speaking about. So the Jews were plotting against him, tried to catch him, tried to work against him so that he couldn't teach the word of God in the places where he was going. And there he abode three months, and when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him to Asia Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timotheus, and of Asia Tychius and Tophimus. Now this only makes sense, of course, when you have the map here. And that's why I put the map out here, because you see, um, he, uh, he, accompanied, he was accompanied, accompanied into Asia by Sopater of Berea. Now you see the map that Berea is right here where my hand is, because we know that he came here from Macedonia and went into Greece. And of the Thessalonians, and where are the Thessalonians? Well, the Thessalonians are a little bit more uh, down here somewhere. <laughs> I don't find it right now. Uh, and Thessalonica, here, Thessalonians. So this is Berea and Thessaloni Thessalonica. This is very close to each other. That's why these two people accompanied him, because this was his journey that he was following on here, you see? And Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derby and Timotheus of Asia. So Timotheus came from over here, from Asia. So this is the trip that he took around this, uh, around this area. And of Asia, Tychius and Tophimus. These going before tarried for us at Troas. So that means they went to Troas and waited. At Troas is here, you see. So Berea, Thessalonica, via Philippi, which is not mentioned to Troas, where he is going. Again, I'm going to leave the map now, look it up for yourselves. <laughs> and we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his, his speech until midnight. Now, I don't know if anybody of you two brothers have any comment on this verse 7. I do have one. Yeah, I think that morrow is tomorrow. Yeah. In the morning. Yeah, okay. morrow is tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's not the, uh, the, the, the that's point not that the, I wanted to make. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, many right. people uh, who call themselves Christians uh, will, first attack, day of the week. Ah. will attack you because it says here, upon the first day of the week, when mm. the disciples came together to break bread, ah, but they assembled on the first day of the week. You see, there was no Sabbath anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember all the little, uh, all the verses we spoke before or we read before this? how many times the Sabbath was mentioned. And in the Sabbath, what did they do? They went into the synagogue and they preached the word of God, right? Now, on the first day of the week, they do what? They break the bread. 
Well, we are to break the bread means do the Holy Communion as Jesus Christ ordained it, not as the Roman Catholic Church um, celebrates it with the sacrifice of transubstantiation. But we are about to break the bread in Holy Communion as often as we want, and we do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. This has nothing to do with this is a day of veneration. That has nothing to do with that this is a day of rest. This has nothing to do with that this is a special day of worship. It has everything to do with the people coming together the first day of the week and breaking bread together. Nothing special that can be done on every day of the week. So there are many people who use this point in the Bible to point out the Sabbath is done away with. Of course, in that moment, they are disregarding all the earlier mentions of the Sabbath. But that's typical for people like uh, like that I'm mentioning right now, right? Mm -hmm. So, but maybe there is another question or remark from Brett or Michael here before I continue. No, please go no. on. That's okay. good. That's good. Verse 8 then, and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. So that means he, was, he fell down from the third floor on the ground, on the street, and yeah, like in those days, like today, when you fall from the third floor, sleeping on the ground, you are probably not surviving. That's what he did. He was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him, said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again, and had broken bread, and eaten, and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive, and were not a little comforted. So, mm. what did Paul do? He went down, he embraced him, he continued to take the Lord's Supper, yeah, to do the Holy Communion. He departed, and he left the young man alive. He gave him life back. Not Paul, God did, through him. Okay? One of the wonders that Paul fomented during his journey through Asia, through his discipleship. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. No, they were very great comforted. <laughs> and we went before to ship and sailed unto Essos, there intending to take in Paul for so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Essos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trogilium. And the next day we came to Miletus. Miletus, again, is something that you find on the map right here. That's Miletus. Okay? So they went over this place. By the way, they went probably very close to the Isle of Patmos that you see here, which is the island where the Apostle John wrote the uh, book of Revelation a few years later. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. I explained that already earlier. The plots they had against him. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Means, like Jesus Christ, speaking everything. Yeah? Everything is put out in the open. Compare that to the world we live in today, where so many people hold back a lot of information, a lot of things. But here, Paul 
did not keep back anything that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, because there is no difference between Jew or Greek. They all can receive the grace of God when they repent, yeah? testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, meaning also to the Gentiles, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, because you cannot have the one without the other. You cannot have repentance toward God and no having no faith into our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are inseparable. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Or in other words, a little bit shorter, I don't care what befalls me on my journey or what befalls me at Jerusalem. I don't care for my own life. I only care for that I have to uh, the, testim uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ and that I preach the gospel and the grace of God everywhere I go. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And now comes a very important verse in my understanding. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now why is this an important verse, you mean. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not a Bible teacher. I don't have to do the study all by myself. Maybe you have an idea why this is important to me. No? Okay. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Another word for overseers is bishop, Right? To feed the church of God means feed my sheep. Okay, that leads us to John 21 verse 17 where the Bible says, quote, Jesus, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Peter here in John is acting as an example for all the bishops. He is not the only feeder of sheep, as many people like to take this verse out of context, and I'm of especially, of course, addressing Roman Catholic priests and Roman Catholic preachers. Peter is not the only preacher. He is just an example of all the bishops. And this is what Paul addresses here. Yeah? He says, The Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. An overseer is a bishop. The Holy Ghost hath made all of you overseers to feed the church of God. That means feed my sheep, as Jesus commanded. Jesus was taking Peter as an example here, but not as the only one. Therefore, of course, we established that already in other studies, that Peter was not in Rome, that Peter was not the first pope, that Peter was not the first bishop of Rome, but that Peter just uh, was an example for all the others. And Paul picks that up here and says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, means all the sheep, 
over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, bishops, to feed the sheep of the sheep of the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Yeah? All the flock is purchased by Jesus Christ with his own blood. That's what he paid the price for at the cross at Golgotha. So, now that I tried to explain this, maybe there are some questions or some remarks from you guys. Thanks, Jörg. No, uh, no, no remark. Um, okay, Michael? Neither? No, no, nothing at all. Okay. <laughs> For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And the church's history, and I speak of the real church's history, is full of examples of this. I don't need to go into any details. But surely we are aware of the falling away of the church in 321 AD when Constantine baptized the pagan Roman Empire with Christianity. And that is of course a grievous wolf who entered in among the congregation of the Church of Christ to... to cover the pagan Roman Empire with quote-unquote Christianity. And by that, he didn't make pagan Rome Christian, he made Christianity pagan. That's the big point. And this is one of the points that Paul wants in front of here. And he knows that the moment that he is gone, Peter, who is an eyewitness of the service of Jesus Christ, yeah, because he met Jesus Christ in person, on the road to Damascus. Yeah? So he is counted as an eyewitness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ was walking the earth as a man, as much as a God of course, but as a man and in the flesh, he warned that when he was gone, that people, that, that grievous wolves would also come into the church and destroy the church. And this is what Paul repeats here. And this has to be repeated all over again. When you have a congregation, however small, it doesn't matter, two or three people are a assembly in the sight of God, because Jesus Christ said, wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, in their midst I will be. You have to take care that you don't make that assembly too big, because the bigger your assembly gets, the more it can be affected by infiltration, which is the way how the Jesuits succeeded to infiltrate all the quote-unquote Protestant denominations for the last 400 years and to turn them around and to bring them back under the wings of Rome. And this is, in other words, what Paul is warning here about. Yeah? So, you have to be careful because Paul already says, I know this. It is not that, hey, this can happen, or maybe this happens, or um, I have a suspicion. No, I know this. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I like to remark, sorry to yeah. step in, I like to remark that he knew it uh, long before John has uh, written the Revelation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It is not so only yet. John in the Revelation that warns about that, it is also Paul yeah. who warns about that, and... Yeah, it is in numerous places. I think in the in the gospel in the New Testament. Yeah, but but the Roman Catholic Church always claims that uh, it's uh, just uh, the revelation uh, has to be uh, missed out out of the books because it's just a prophetic book. But here we see that uh, not only in the um, uh, Second Thessalonican uh, chapter is it mentioned, but also in the Acts chapter. Yeah, and on other places also. I don't know the yeah. places now by heart, but I can tell you it is mentioned at least in three, four, five places in the New Testament. Um, like also the point, uh, be not deceived by any man, you know, which is kind of the same message. Yeah. yeah, That's absolutely correct, Michael. The point is that Paul says here, with utmost conviction, with absolute truth and certainty, for I know this. I do not assume, I do not think, it maybe is, maybe that. No, no, no. Hätte, hätte, Fahrradkette, as we, as we say in German. Mm -hmm. He knows this. Huh? He is absolutely sure. When he departs, 
grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He is a watchman on the wall to call the people to attention, to take heed that they will not be deceived by grievous wolves who will enter among the congregation and will tear the flock apart. How do they do that? It's not about killing the people with swords. It's about putting wrong teaching into the church. And that's what happened. And that's why Paul is warning about this. Not because he thinks it's going to happen, because he knows it's going to happen. It's a surety. Is that the right word, Brad? Sure. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. What, what does that say here? That even within the congregation, you will have people who will fall into apostasy. How can he be so sure about this? I mean, this is such an easy question to answer. How can he be so, so sure about that also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them? Because the whole quote-unquote Old Testament is full of Israel falling away into apostasy. Out from themselves, they weren't infiltrated by Philistines and Chaldeans and Syrians and Babylonians. They weren't infiltrated by them that turned around the word of God within their congregation. No, the people of themselves from within became apostate. And because the whole Old Testament is proof to this, of course Paul is sure that it will also happen now. What happened in the former times will also happen in later times. That's what he's saying here. Of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things. So he warns the congregation that out of your own assembly there shall be people come up speaking perverse things, which means perverse, means unrighteous, means not according to the gospel, to draw away disciples after them. That means he is giving an example of Lucifer, because Lucifer was one of the angels speaking perverse things and draw angels after him, right? And yeah, the same example you have here. Yeah, please, Michael. Yeah, it's the same story all over again, I think. It's just uh, that uh, out of every seed, there is uh, someone who betrays the real faith. It's just, uh, for uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, the cherubim uh, Lucifer in, in the heaven. Um, and it's also from, for example, from uh, Noah's seed. If we uh, consider um, Ham, Cush, and, and Nimrod, or if you if you like to to think of uh, Judas Iscariot, and so there is also someone who has been uh, deceived by Satan in this world. Yeah, but when you go to uh, Noah. Mm -hmm. And you mention his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, I think their names are. Mm -hmm. You have to consider yeah. that the sons were righteous. Okay. That's something that we will enter when we go into our Bible study in the book of Genesis, which we just started in German to do. Mm -hmm. We come into Genesis uh, 8, 9, ah. and 10 after the flood. Yeah, I see your point. It's, it's just from the from the line of, of, of their women, I think. it's uh, Exactly. Originated. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you got yeah. it already. Yeah, that's the yeah. point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch. Be watchmen on the wall. What does uh, Daryl always say? Ezekiel chapter 3 something, where it speaks about the watchmen. Yeah? And remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone, night and day, even with tears. And now, brethren, I command you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel, yea, 
Ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. What's he talking about here? Ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities. He was working as a tent maker. He was supplying for him own, for himself. He didn't live off ties. He didn't live like the Pope in a fancy palace, sitting on a fancy chair and having all the world pay for him. He went down and worked for his own life support. Ye yourselves know that these hands I have worked with my hands have ministered unto my necessities. So everything that I needed, I worked for and to them that were with me. And I worked also for the ones that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. So you, how can you support the weak when you have something of your own, right? Well, this is getting very important in the next coming sentence here, in the next words. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, we of course have to understand that Paul already is warning here in very distinct words, but sometimes not everybody grasps the idea of it. He is warning here of the doings of the Antichrist. I, Paul, a disciple of God, have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. So through your own work, you will gain so much that you can support yourselves. And what you have an increase of, you remember by the words of the Lord to give to others. Meaning, you support the weak with what you have as surplus what you own for yourself. Not to store it up, because Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 6, not to lay our treasures here on earth, where moth and rust or thieves can get it, but to put it in where our heart is, to put our treasure in heaven. Right? And Jesus Christ also said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, how can I give if I don't have private property. Now, study the papal encyclical Caritas in Veritate, where the Pope, who claims to be the vicar of Christ on earth, wants to make us all communists, wants to make all common good. Yeah? And therefore, nobody has private property anymore. But if I don't have any private belongings... I cannot give the increase to people who are weak. So here already, Paul is teaching something that many people attack Christians on. Oh, Christians are communists, you know, because they have no own. They, they give everything to the weak or they give everything, they have a common good. Well, that's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Paul teaches here, I do work with my own hands, in verse 34, and with this I earn enough money to support myself and everything that I have a surplus of and that I do not need, I will give to the ones who are weak, who don't have as much as I do, because it is more blessed to give than to receive. But for to give, I first have to have. If I don't have any personal belongings anymore, I cannot give anything away, can I? No. And this is how he warns of the Antichrist, at least in my understanding of this verse 35. I don't know if you guys have any uh, additions to make to that what I just said and read and explained. No, I do, but I have to look it up because I'm not so familiar with the English now. Well, okay, look it up. And, uh, it just, it just, it just reminds me of the, the last of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet. Mm -hmm. Covet means that you shall not want something that somebody else has, that is of somebody else's ownership. Yeah, that's yeah. coveting. Yeah. That's, that's what I mean, because you, uh, so it is uh, quite natural, as, as, as it has been stated in the, in the, in the Ten Commandments, to that, that men uh, or men uh, have some property. 
Yeah, so I, I don't... Because I, if you I, don't have any private property, there can nothing be covetous, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's just uh, just the way it, 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 shall, it shall be, because you, all, all, you are um, condemned after the rejection out of the, the Garden of Eden. Um, man shall labor, man shall work on the field, for example, and so they got to have a field which are... Uh, uh, which I can work on, 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 you see. Right. That's that's my my simple uh, understanding of this. Well, let me just put it this way: this verse 35 has an implementation on two commandments. It has an implementation on the commandment "Thou shalt not steal," and it has an implementation on the commandment "Thou shalt not covet." Mm -hmm. I cannot steal if there is no private property. Yeah. And I cannot covet if there is no private property. And that's exactly what the Antichrist wants to abolish in this world that we are living in. He wants to abolish every private property and by that nullify the seventh in my regard, I think, thou shalt not steal commandment and the tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, it is, in, in this regard, I find it very interesting to see when you understand who the Antichrist is and what the working of the Antichrists are, you read the Bible with whole new understanding, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an understanding that I didn't get out of it a few years ago when I read it for the first time. Even then I knew that the papacy was the Antichrist, but, you know, it's like every time when you read this a little more, the Holy Spirit will reveal a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more wisdom, biblical wisdom. And that's just something that popped into me the same, uh, today. This is why I took this little note here. Uh, because I had a little time to, to study this book of Acts before we came together on uh, on the microphone today. How can we give if no private property is allowed? Yeah, that's, uh, I think uh, that's uh, quite a big point, because you, you, you then also can reveal that this uh, papist system is of the Antichrist because it does not uh, go in line according to the Ten Commandments. Right. It goes, on, it goes only in line with its own Roman Catholic canon law, the law of men instead of the law of God. Yeah, yeah which also, where they claim that only the Roman Catholic uh, uh, Pope or, 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 or the Vatican uh, has the right to, to ownership. Yeah, and he distributes it all to who he thinks has need. And if he doesn't think that you have need, then you have a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's continue. Verse 36. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. And then we go into the next chapter, 21. And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto course, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence to Patara. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we sent aboard and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for there, for there the ship was to unlaid her burden. Means they got rid of their cargo. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when he had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship, and they returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemias. Oh, I cannot <laughs> pronounce this word. Mm -hmm. Ptolemias. And saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. 
And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed, and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. You remember Philip, one of the seven? That was in, uh, I think, Acts chapter 2 or 3, where they are going to uh, where they are going to make more not more apostles but um, people who help them you know you had this uproar of uh, uh, of the Jews who said that they were neglecting the the widows and all that uh, of the Greeks that they were neglecting the widows and then they were uh, uh, how do you say that um, Recruiting, let's say, let's call it this way, recruiting more people to help them to spread the word of God in one of the first chapters of Acts. And Philip is one of these seven that they took. And um, if I'm not mistaken, Stephen is another one of the seven, but he's the one that got stoned then. Okay? So in the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, and bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth his, this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when he heard these things, both we and they that, uh, both we and they of that place, besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. So what happens here? When they take company of Philippus, uh, Philip, Philip the evangelist in his home, there came up this man, Agabus, a prophet, yeah? and he tells us, Paul, when you go to Jerusalem, the Jews will finally get to you, because they have already put up many traps of him, they have persecuted him already many times before, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this girdle, so you, Paul, they will bind and they deliver you into the hands of the Gentiles. Means, Paul, you will have the same fate as Jesus Christ, who was bound and put before the Gentiles. He was put before Pontius Pilate. He was put before the Romans, right? Exactly the same thing this Agabus prophesies to Paul here. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him, speaking of Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. Now then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. So, they say, Paul says first and for all, as he said already earlier, as we read in chapter 19, he says, I don't care for my life. I care for bring the gospel everywhere where I go. And I need to go to Jerusalem now because it is the Feast of Pentecost and I want to spend it over there. And even though this quote-unquote prophet comes to tell him, well, the Jews will bind you with the girdle as much as I did here to give you the sign, they will prison you, they will imprison you, they will bring you before the Gentiles, means they will bring you before Rome, and you will be sentenced, you will be probably slain or whatever, Paul says, well, <laughs> the will of the Lord be done. What did Jesus Christ say when he was praying in Gethsemane before the crucifixion? Father, let this cup pass on me, but not my will be done, but your will be done. Right? And this is of the same spirit that Paul says, the will of the Lord be done. And after those days we took up our carriage and, uh, carriages and went up to Jerusalem.
There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea, and brought with them one Mnason of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, that's one of the brothers, half-brothers of Jesus Christ, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So, Paul gives a testimony of the conversion of the Gentiles that he had achieved through his journey through Macedonia, Thyatira, Asia, and Greece. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there were which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitudes the multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Now, what I find interesting right here is to see that purify thyself with them and be a charges with them that they may shave their heads. You remember in one of our last sessions, a little bit earlier in the book of Acts, we read that Paul shaved his head because he had a vow. You remember? Nope. Slightly, 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 slightly. Okay, let's just say, okay, let's park this here. Um, let's look the word shave. Okay, why is it not here? Uh, let's do that word head or oh, vow. Let's take vow. I know Next it was vow. X twenty one. Twenty one? Twenty one verse twenty four. So this is not where I am here. Okay, let's just see. Where are we here? Twenty one. Oh that that that's about it what we are about to read. Sorry. No, that's that's where we are about to read, yeah. yeah. No no no. We we read that earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. I, was it was it in Acts uh, maybe it was in the part before, uh, one through fourteen the first 14 chapters. There we already read once that Paul went and he shaved his head and uh, he, he had a vow. Okay. Um, if we can't find it here, let's just look for it here in the Bible index and um, let's just use the word shave and look in the New Testament and see I know it was there. I'm not stupid. I don't know where. Acts 18.18 18. And Paul after this tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquia, having shorn his head in Cancria, for he had a vow. So, that is having shorn his head. So, uh, yeah, okay, that's why I don't find it with shaved. Shaved and shorn, yeah. Sure. <laughs> that's the past version. Okay. <laughs> this is this is a saying we say in in uh, Minnesota here. My mother would say it all the time, shaved and shorn and so forlorn or something like that. Yeah, shorn is just the past uh, version mm -hmm. of shor of shave, right? Shave exactly. is present and uh, shorn is uh, present past. perfect uh, or past perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, just another time. So you see, I I knew I wasn't stupid. I knew it was there. I didn't just know right. where to find just it. Right, just a different word. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, but it, it, it actually says the same. Paul, after these tarried there yet a good while, having shorn his head in Cancria, so that's the place, for he had a vow. Now we come over this again here. Them take and purify thyself with them, these four men, which have a vow on them, yeah? and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads, and they have a vow. And he, sh shave, he shore his head, for he had a vow. And all may know that those things whereof thy were in, uh, they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. So I cannot tell you what this Im uh, implies, what is actually the deeper meaning of it. I can only tell you that there is a relation or a correlation between Acts 18.18 18 and Acts 21.24, which we are reading here, because it's about the same idea. Shaving heads and having a vow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you guys help me with an explanation on this? Because I know I only see that there's a connection between this, a, a vital connection to understand even probably. But I don't know what this vow implies and what that shaving of heads imp uh, implies. Do you guys have any idea of that? I think sadly no. Non-biblical. So I think that's just a, just a, an, 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 uh, to display that they are on a, on a certain mission, maybe. But I, I, I think it's not revealed here. Yeah, it's not revealed here. That's uh, that's for sure. Yeah. Otherwise, we understood it probably. Yeah. Okay. That's gonna be probably then for next time to understand this correctly because um, this. Uh, chapter 21 still goes on for a little while so i think it may be good that we stop over here and then next time maybe we can think about this maybe we can study on this a little bit uh, on our own in the meantime and the next time when we come together maybe we can make a little bit more out of it and see where there is this connection between acts 18 18 and 21 23 and see what that has to do with it and what does it have to do with having a vow on them and shaving their heads because these four people are actually kind of a bodyguard for Paul. That's the way that I understand it. And they will protect Paul wherever he goes. And uh, this shaving head and having a vow is kind of a way to convict the Jews that he is preaching the law, just not the law that they adhere to because he is teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and not the law of Moses anymore. Anyway, I, I'd say leave it with this and we can continue next time here and then you guys maybe have a, uh, have also studied this a little bit and have a, an idea what uh, the Bible here speaks about. I for the moment um, find it about an hour that we did the study uh, enough for today and um, I learned a little bit. I hope you did too. And uh, mm -hmm. I leave uh, I leave the conclude uh, the concluding remarks to Michael and Brett, please. Yeah, thank you, Jörg, for the reading. Um, I think because of the uh, shaving of the heads, uh, it's uh, in contrary. I think it's uh, the to the Leviticus uh, book where it is ordained that the man should cut his hair and has to grow his beard. So it must be a, a special, a special uh, mission, uh, because uh, in in my humble un, un, uh, understanding, it's uh, just forbidden um, in the Leviticus, in in the, in the law of, of Moses, that uh, men shall shave their heads um, totally. But um, as you as you just pointed out, uh, it's not the law of Moses now; uh, it's just a new. Uh, law of uh, the Jesus Christ in, in, in the um, in the New Testament, but it's not my vital point. My vital point is that in the chapter 20, I, I, I recently uh, learned that uh, Paul was the apostle who could, with the help of uh, the the Holy Spirit and of Jesus Christ, of course, um, help to. Um, get a young man which has been uh, fallen down three floors uh, back to life. And um, I don't know what the upcoming chapters will reveal. 
until the end of the X uh, chapter, of course. But in my understanding, it's, uh, it occurs that uh, Paul is the apostle with the highest authority to do so, because it's not known to me um, so far that any other apostle could do this. And so, in my understanding, I think it's uh, just that uh, that Paul is the apostle with the highest priority. And uh, therefore, I think it's just another reason why uh, the Roman Church does not teach the uh, the X chapter, because there it is uh, just about, uh, it, it, it's more about uh, Paul so far, and uh, his abilities and, uh, and, and uh, on his mission. So it's my understanding from the chapter 20 that Paul is the apostle who has, uh, yeah, has a has a has a special task and uh, is is more detailed uh, written about here about Paul. And so, in my understanding, it's just another uh, hint that uh, Paul could be uh, the the key element, uh, which uh, the Roman Catholic Church does not like to to uh, to point to because it would distract them from their theory that uh, Peter was in Rome and Peter was the head of the apostles. And uh, on this uh, s s chapter here, I think it's uh, quite clear that uh, Paul has got the most uh, authority of and, and abilities and uh, the, the uh, important mission of all uh, disciples so far. And uh, mm -hmm. with, it, with this, I'd like to hand it over to Brett. Uh, just before Brett takes over, I have to tell you okay. there's also there were also other uh, disciples mentioned, uh, other apostles mentioned, um, who were waking up the dead. Um, I'm just looking for that in the book of Acts. Uh, in the Acts chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the Acts chapter. We read about that before, that also other uh, apostles uh, wo woke men from, uh, from the dead to the living again. So I'm just looking for that where that is. Um, but in the meantime, of course, Brett can take yeah, I, over. I have, I have just, just a slight. I haven't heard of this story so far. So I was uh, just in the. Um, I, I thought uh, for myself, wow, that's a thing which I haven't heard uh, before. So I was uh, quite sure that it would be an outstanding feature. Okay. I'm, I'm quite sure that we read about earlier that also other uh, apostles, uh, the apostles when they brought the word of God into Asia Minor, um, they waked people from the dead. That's uh, I'm quite sure that we read that. Mm -hmm. I don't know where. So anyway, uh, Brett, if you have yes. any final words, then sure. <clears throat> yes. Uh, yeah. There's. Uh <clears throat> I've found that, you know, when I do these types of studies, that uh, sometimes the the answers that you're looking for will be answered in the coming verses, and that uh, these questions can kind of throw you off, but that's just me. Um, I have a different approach in, in terms of um, getting the totality of the chapter, or rather the book, um, and, um, I suppose I should do a little bit more study in advance before getting to the microphone because, uh, I feel like an idiot today. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> well, we, we have to look into this again, but I, I tell you, I'm quite sure that we read this before, uh, that when the apostles went out and uh, taught the word of God, that, that they were all uh, here and there uh, resurrecting uh, people, uh, waking people from the dead. It was not just Paul who did this. I'm, I'm quite sure about that. I cannot give you the point right now. Well, but wasn't let's, it? Let, let, let's yeah. Look, let's look into this next time. But you have an idea where it is, Brad? Well, no, I was just thinking at the, res uh, the resurrection of Christ on the third day, you know, when the, when the, uh, when the uh, veil was rent in the temple, wasn't no, no, there I'm speaking, all? No, I'm speaking about the book of Acts. Really, in the I book know. of Acts, when uh, when people, uh, when the when the I'm just saying here. Out. I'm just saying that when when Christ arose, wasn't there a bunch of people that that uh, 
that came uh, out of the graves, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, Correct. Jesus Christ was the first that's fruit. That's all. That's all. And yeah. yeah, there were, but that's not the point, Brett. The, the point was that I'm, I'm sure we read in the uh, in the Acts, but I, I, the problem is that I don't have a mind that I can keep that all right here, and I can tell you it was that book, that chapter, that verse. I know that we read in the book of Acts when the apostles first starting to do their work in the mm. Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. yeah, right. that they right. that they resurrected people from the dead. And yeah, that's of not course. Paul alone. So no, yeah, that's because true. That's because yeah, because that's a rectification of what Michael yep, just said about Paul. It's the acts of the apostles. It's the yeah, acts that's of right. the apostles. It's not only yeah. Paul, and, and they did that. I, it is somewhere earlier in these, but. Please sure. then look it up for next time, and then we can talk about this and make sure that we understand it correctly. But as far as I remember, we have read that also other apostles, when they went into, I don't know, Samaria and all that stuff, you know, in the beginning of the book of Acts, that they rose people from the dead. So, okay, then we shall leave it here for today, if that's fine with you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, then we're going to see you next time and we continue our study then in the book of Acts chapter 21 and try to find the verses that speak about the resurrection of the dead by other apostles in earlier chapters of the book of Acts. Until next time, then do the same as we. Pick up your Bible, study your Bible, and read and believe your Bible and love your Bible and by that get to know Jesus Christ. Read your Bible. Maranatha. Yours is a walk which makes me reflect in two ways on the figure of Moses. On the one hand, the patriarch and lawgiver of the people of Israel symbolizes the need of people to keep alive their sense of unity by means of just legislation. On the other, the figure of Moses leads us directly to God. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, But do not ye after their works, for they say, and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries, and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. 
but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereof. And whoso shall swear by them in the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. He that shall swear by heaven sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, and the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto man, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, if we had been in the days of our father, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers! How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets, and wise men, and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scorch in your synagogues, and persecute them from city to city. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily, I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophet and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered my children together, even as a hen gathereth her children under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Jerusalem would love to see many of your followers, Christians, Muslims and Jews, follow your footsteps and do pilgrimage and come and visit us in the city of Jerusalem.